Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome this afternoon. It's, uh, my name is Tammy Dillon, and I will be very brief and just say it's our pleasure to have Daniel and Richard and Wayne here this afternoon uh, to do a book reading and talk about Daniel's book, Seeing Naples, reports, reports from the, sorry, I'm blanking uh, on the name. The Shadow of Vesuvius. The Shadow of Vesuvius. I had the pleasure of going down to New York last fall uh, for Daniel's uh, book reading and launch at the Drawing Center, and um, you're in for a treat. So thank you for coming, and it's my pleasure to introduce Daniel. Well, I'm, I'm Daniel. Uh, welcome. Uh, tonight we're going to speak about my book, uh, Seeing Naples, and uh, Naples more broadly as a, as a subject. Uh, I'd like to thank uh, Francine Hunter McGivern, uh, Tambra Dillon, Caroline Parkinson, Claudia Cinque Grana, and Sage Carter for their support of the book, and the Hudson Hall for hosting. I'm honored and delighted to share the panel with two uh, cultural luminaries this evening. Uh, to my right is the uh, poet, critic, curator, and co-publisher of Edgewise Press, Richard Milazzo. And to my left, poet, painter, librettist, and cultural critic, Wayne Kastenbaum. Uh, and I'd like to begin with some short readings from, from the book. Uh, I discovered quickly, I, I came to Naples with a Fulbright uh, scholarship back in 1990, and I quickly discovered that uh, public transportation was not going to uh, enable me to, to uh, get around the, the city. So I, I bought a second-hand uh, moped on the island of Capri, uh, took driving lessons in Anna Capri, hundreds of feet above the ocean, uh, and then returned to Naples with uh, the moped and steerage. This is when I arrive at the dock in Naples, Rocinante, my, my moped. At the dock in Naples, I started Rocinante and gradually mustered enough courage to enter the traffic that had so frightened me on my arrival. Rocinante's headlight cast a pale yellow beam before me as cars sped by, passing me on both sides, at times brushing my clothing as my heart beat furiously. One false move would have been the end. But fortune smiled on Rocinante's wheels, buzzing me with a monotonous drone toward Piazza Carlo Terzo, and we survived the trials of that night. The next morning, after purchasing a heavy car chain to protect him from thieves, I sought a garage where my steed could board in my absence. Two blocks away, I discovered such a garage. It occupied the cavernous ground floor of a tenement into which hundreds of fiats stood one next to the other. The fumes were overpowering, and the guard dogs that rose to meet me did so in such a sluggish manner and with such e evident pain as to suggest years of confinement in that poisonous atmosphere. It was like passing into the mouth of Hades to be greeted by Cerberus. There were three hellhounds, limping, covered with oil, and missing clots of fur with open sores, but with expressions altogether submissive and benign. The garage's owner, Gennaro, whose family lived upstairs, passed his time playing scopa with Neapolitan cards and chatting with sons and old men who happened by to visit and take coffee. This modern-day Sisyphus spent his workday manually pushing fiats and vespas into the nearest possible physical proximity and later removing them. Once I had settled the business, I filled Rocinante with gasoline and sped off to enjoy my newfound freedom of movement under speeding under a canopy of drying laundry in Lower Naples. A motorino in good weather will take you from one end of the Parthenopian megalopolis to the other in 20 minutes. One has simply to master the technique of weaving through backed-up traffic in 12-inch space between parallel cars or making detours onto the sidewalk past women who nervously clutch their handbags. Of course, there are shortcomings to driving a motorino. Once I ran out of gasoline on a Sunday when no gas stations were open and had to push Rocinante from the Villa Comunale to the Piazza Carlo Terzo, a three-hour affair. In the, in the rain, water often bathes the spark plug causing the motorino to die wherever you happen to be driving. And of course, you can always be hit by a car. It happened to me twice. But unless you're extraordinarily patient, it is the best way to traverse Naples. Th this is a visit to the uh, Academy of Fine Arts. 
Several days after my arrival, I walked to the Neapolitan Academy of Fine Arts, located in a small piazza off Via Roma. Its massive doors stood open, flanked by cast iron lions that were covered with graffiti denigrating the faculty. I walked up the steps and was greeted by the concierge, who was seated in a little booth to my right. He was a small man with a brutish forehead, scars, and missing an eye behind his glasses. He set down his soccer magazine and with a prominent limp, shuffled out of the booth to greet me. I asked if I could see the courtyard of the academy and he ushered me in. I later discovered that communist legislation of the 1960s favoring the employment of former convicts had actually given them priority over non-convicts and that the maintenance staff of the academy included wife murderers and highwaymen. In the center of the courtyard stood a pink gazebo of wrought iron in which peacocks strutted back and forth. Rather than hiring new faculty or improving the facilities, the director of the school had decided to beautify this building, which, in the feudal tradition of European academia, had become something of his own baronial estate. I later gave a series of lectures at the academy and discovered that the director was very much like the figure of Kerensky in Eisenstein's October, emulating the movements of a peacock. I took my leave, descending the steps into the piazzetta, where I sat down on one of the numerous granite blocks that served as benches. The unsavory gentleman who moments ago had been seated in his booth was now outside, supervising the work of a starveling who was scrubbing graffiti off the lions. The new man, equipped with soapy water, appeared to be an emaciated heroin addict, and only with great difficulty was he able to dip his sponge into the bucket and drag it over the lion. To my left was the Galleria Principe di Napoli, the oldest in the city, built between 1876 and 1887. Lovers, was, lovers were seated around a ledge that followed the interior contours of the gallery. They embraced, kissed, and playfully slapped one another in public view between the prominent thoroughfares of Via Brogia and Via Furia. In my piazzetta, children played soccer, maneuvering the granite blocks from time to time, and from time to time kicking the ball dangerously close to the convict and his lackey. On the corner was the bar Belle Arti, in which a man stood sugaring espresso coffee as it oozed sap-like from a machine dating to the Belle Epoque. <laughs> After filling five or six cups, he sat them on a tray and gave them to a teenage boy dressed impeccably in a white apron and hat who carried them past the soccer players and up the stairs, disappearing into the academy. In a corner of the bar sat its proprietress, dressed in a tiara and black dressing gown. With dignity and bearing, she dispersed a delicious perfume of ground coffee by fanning herself. She watched the barman's every move, calling to mind the Neapolitan proverb, a horse gains weight only under its owner's watchful eye. Uh, and finally, the, the last reading, a visit, a visit to Egidio. Egidio Balestrieri had been a welder in Naples from childhood when he worked in his brother's shop. Before and after the Second World War, he worked at the Neapolitan shipyards, building and repairing damaged vessels, and in the 1950s, he opened a shop of his own in the industrial quarter. Egidio is a portly man with pinkish flesh who merrily breaks public ordinances and sings Neapolitan songs as he welds. We met one morning around 10 o'clock Egidio had arrived dressed in a suit and tie and proceeded to change into his white workman's overalls. I parked Rocinante next to the welder's shop and Egidio ad indicated with a hand gesture a rapid movement of the fingers as if taking something that would be tempting thieves, so I led my steed into the shop. Egidio's workshop was small with a fresh coat of paint. On, on the wall was an image of Santa Lucia, the patron saint of welders who protects the eyes. Three clients and idle proprietors of adjoining businesses were drinking coffee and gossiping in dialect by the door. Egidio consigned a newly mended engine block to a mechanic and his assistant, who loaded it into the back of their shaky ape buggy and started off down the wrong way of a one-way street. A policeman wandered in to greet Egidio and gossip with the others, but Egidio brusquely ordered him out of the way. Carrying a piece of incandescent steel and pincers out of doors, he quenched it in water amid cackling, boiling noise, and rising clouds of steam. 
A 13-year-old girl holding her younger sister's hand walked past the shop and received a lascivious glare from the six men who had hitherto been gossiping. I had come straight from the foundry, bearing a large pod-like sculpture which needed to be welded. Egidio looked at me as though I were crazy. American, uh, the American, he exclaimed. Egidio's cronies watched me with guarded curiosity. Egidio, Egidio's assistant dragged a perforated 50-gallon drum from the back, filled it with wood, and lit it with a welding torch. Egidio then grabbed the lip of the drum with pincers and dragged it across the street as cars zipped past him at high speeds. The assistant threw my sculpture in and let it preheat before welding and returned to help with other tasks. Egidio has a keen analytical mind. In precision welding, the most difficult task is in preparing objects to be welded, ensuring that they don't move or shift under the heat of the torch. He prepares jigs, clamps, claws, and elaborate wiring systems to keep these objects still. For Egidio, welding is more like an instinctual function than a learned skill. He feels when the metal is nearly fluid, and with a subtle movement of his torch, draws it together, swirling and dancing beneath his flame. Egidio withdraws the torch, and the metal, as if deprived of life, chills, yielding its color and movement, becoming a dull, ashy seam. The pot-like sculpture glowed with warmth as Egidio's assistant lifted it onto the welding table with soaking towels. Steam hissed from the pod, filling the work workshop with vapor, and Egidio set to work, uniting the pieces. His brow was covered with beads of sweat, and his glasses, which were fogged over, his brow was covered with beads of sweat, and his glasses, which had been fogged by vapor, became clear and lucid. He worked quickly, rotating the object as he welded with a wet towel. The workshop became a steamy nymphaeum, a cave-like womb. At last, the sculpture was finished, and the assistant carried it to the sidewalk to cool. Egidio cackled with delight and drank a demitasse of strong coffee. So beautiful. The, the language seems to me just to be um, a product not only of intellect, but uh, uh, sensibility and um, just a perfect combination for a writer and an artist. Um, yeah. would, would you like to, to make your remarks? Uh, you know, I think, why don't we just have a little, this, my remarks are a little bit on the lugubrious side, so why don't we talk a little bit and then I can bore the audience when they're really tired and they're not conscious. All right, very good. <laughs> lugubrious, how funny. Well, I could say, if, I could say just first a, a, a quick couple of things. We could talk loosely, or, or should I say a quick couple no, of things? Should, I'll say, say my quick couple of things, yeah. which I pray are not lugubrious. What I wanted to point out, uh, there are several things I would like to point out about this really wonderful book. And the first is the, the sumptuousness of its design and how, as they say in the trade, well published it is, for which we have Richard, as well as Daniel, and other secret um, sharers and helpers. Uh, to thank that uh, I urge you when you buy it, if you haven't already, and take a look at it, that you'll notice uh, the incorporation of antique uh, typefaces, the present, which are really, have because Daniel is in some sense primarily a visual artist as well as a delicate, gifted writer. Um, the, the, the various kinds of, um, arrangements, detournement in the book around such issues as typeface and photographs perform some of the miraculous work alongside the text. One thing in particular, there are photographs by David, by Daniel, <laughs> D -D, by Daniel, um, modestly signed um, DR 1991. Some of them are self-portraits, but they're in black and white like some of the early 20th century photographs in the book or film stills. So there's this strange sense of timelessness and tonal play. The one thing, the thing I want to point out in David's Daniels, what is wrong with me? It's Freudian slip for us later to discuss. Daniels, 
book, what I would like to point out is that there is very little self-consciousness or the kind of um, self-inquiry that usually dominates autobiographies, and yet nonetheless this is a kind of covert autobiography of a voyager. And the thing that I find most beautiful in the book is Daniel's gift for sudden friendships and as a consequence of that, his ability to create these portraits of the Neapolitans. He, he, he read a couple of those, um, but it's a, it's a telling thing throughout the book that this youthful wanderer in a strange, melancholy, death-haunted city makes instant friendships with perhaps unlikable, difficult, <laughs> distrustful of American <laughs> natives. And one by one, the archaeology of Naples gets performed by Daniel. I'm going to just read a paragraph from one of these. In the Matera chapter, wanting you to listen not only to the, the pellucid quality of Daniel's style, but to the, the, the sense of a instant acquaintanceship uh, being portrayed. Here, Daniel is, you're in a church, right? And you're on a quest for, uh, you're on a portraiture task. What are you doing, someone asked. I turned around, and standing before me was a young man in threadbare clothing with slightly disheveled hair and a two-day-old beard. His features were severe, with an aquiline nose and pronounced cheekbones. He was holding a goat cheese sandwich that appeared to be his lunch. I explained to him that I was an American visitor, that I found Matera quite fascinating, and that I intended to make some drawings of the place. He introduced himself as Giuseppe and explained how he had come from a family of farmers, but that they had lost their land and how he now came to Matera from the hinterland each day to assist a carpenter for wages equivalent to $20 a day. Then that encounter goes on a bit. And then now we're with Giorgio for your appointment with Giorgio. And here is what happens with Giorgio. We selected paper, cut it, left it to soak, and began to ink a plate for our first proof. I was delighted to be working again, and I enjoyed the smell of linseed oil and ink that was being rendered more fluid on a hot plate. I mixed colors, and we painstakingly rolled them onto marble slabs with lithography rollers that resembled oversized rolling pins. At last, we each succeeded in inking adjoining plates, and I assembled the pieces on the bed of the press, taking care not to smudge the ink we had so laboriously applied. We lay down paper and felt and ran the plate through the press. Giorgio lifted the blanket away and with folded paper tabs, gently peeled the paper off the plate. Giorgio and I continued to work long hours throughout the week. And so the there's this sense of an impromptu ecole or atelier, the kind of edu an education being formed through these spontaneously made acquaintances in a city not known for hospitality to young men on Fulbrights. <laughs> <laughs> um, to, for Daniel to get a compliment about his writing and the, the beauty of it and the insightfulness of it from Wayne Kalstenbaum. And forgive me, I don't want to sound, make this sound like we're a mutual admiration society, but for Wayne, who is himself a superlative writer, who I would, and I barely, uh, rarely ever give this kind of compliment, who I might compare to someone like Nabokov or Joseph Conrad, who was a marvelous non-English Right, a, a non-English person writing the best English prose uh, ever. Uh, it's a great compliment uh, to Daniel and a much deserved one coming from Wayne. Um, a, couple of, a couple of things. Um, Rochinante, wh wh what does it mean and how did it come about that you would call your moped that? 
Oh, a friend had, had quipped that uh, the moped was Rocinante with uh, Don Quixote's uh, steed. Uh, and in, in fact, it was very horse-like. The, the moped is, uh, you know, is much better suited to the vicoli, these, these slender alleyways of Naples than, uh, than a car. So, so it made sense. But there was something quixotic about the, about the whole uh, project and my sojourn in Naples. Yeah, yeah you know, I, when, when, I, um, when I first encountered your, 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 um, your, your, your moped, I, I thought of that wonderful film about uh, uh, Castro when they're going around the, they're traveling from uh, southern uh, part of South America all the way up to the northern part, up to through Mexico. I don't, know, I don't know what the name of that film is. Um, yeah, it's just a wonderful film, and I kept thinking, that's kind of like Daniel a little bit. Um, Wayne, I just wanted to, and Daniel, I just wanted to uh, say one thing now that comes to my mind, which is, um, I would like to tell you how the book came into my hands as a co-publisher. By the way, one of the, the other co-publishers is Joy Glass, and she's over there hiding. And the other, uh, other co-publisher is Howard, Howard Johnson, who couldn't be here today. Um, and, and uh, just for self-promotion's sake, we've been in, Edgewise is a small press that's been in existence since 1995. And you know, the half-life of presses in America is 15 seconds or something like, a in actuality, 10 years. And we've been around this long. We're, we publish very few books, but we, we, we try to do the best that we can with those books. And I would add publishing very important um, permanent canonical books in at the intersection of art and writing. And it's, it's great to see you in this company. A great, great honor. I, I was uh, completely uh, gobsmacked that I... Uh, so I, w I want to tell you the story about how the book, it, it's a kind of amusing to me anyway, how the book, uh, my response to the book originally. One, other th one thing I want to add to Wayne's comment is that what I love the most about the books we do is that they're sewn and they're sewn so that when you open them 30 years from now, they don't just, 15 minutes from now, normally an American-made, American-manufactured book, you just open it flat and it falls apart. Our books will be around for far longer than we will be, so. Um, but you know, Daniel originally sent me the book for an endorsement, and I hate endorsements. Um, so I don't like doing that, and I started reading the book, and I was so taken by the, the writing, uh, the, the, the subject matter, but, but the writing itself that I contacted Daniel, who I'd known for a number of years, and said, gee, would you mind awfully much if we tried to publish this book? And, uh, and, he, and he was open to it, and he was a marvel to work with because um, just, just um, it was a complex book, a, a complex project to do, and what made it even more lovely was that we would meet uh, at um, Hasaki, which is, I'm sure some of you know, in Manhattan, a wonderful Japanese restaurant, which is becoming more expensive every day. Um, and we would sit there and, and plan like two soldiers what our next steps were, and it was just a marvel. Uh, do you want to read your, oh, sorry. Well, I, I, I would just like to, to mention also that th this work had a very long gestation. I mean, it was written over the course of 20, 25 years, but Richard, who designed the book, and uh, did so very, um, with, with great care, and there was that temporal dimension of, of two years in the, in, in the design process, and Richard has suggested that we use a Neapolitan typeface. I, I did some research and had difficulty finding, uh, finding one, but then I, I had a book that had been published in the 18th century in Naples, and I scanned the typeface, recomposed it, but the elegant um, design of the book is Richard's uh, doing, and it was such a such an honor and a pleasure to. You, you know, I'd like to tell. I like that sounds like a compliment, but let me tell you what the truth is. I, I'm obsessive compulsive, and so every comma in a book matters to me. And uh, I remember once publishing a book that used um, hyphen, you know, uh, hyphens at the end of the line, which is not uncommon uh, for broken words. And someone years ago said to me, you know, Richard, you, 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 you pride yourself in what you do, but you're, you're awful. I said, well, why am I so awful? Tell me why. He says, well, you have insects all over your books. Uh, and I didn't know what she was talking about, but then I realized when you look at the books, usually the, those hyphens, unless you, of course, sometimes you have to 
custom insert one because uh, there'll be too many rivers and lakes in the text. But the minute I became conscious of the fact that those little hyphens were like just an abomination. Uh, so it's really about obsessive compulsiveness. It's not about anything else. It's really about an illness. <laughs> I mean, there's the, the, the question of revisitation is so ripe in this book because there's you, there's the revisit, there's a visiting as a young person, a city that is ancient layer after layer of it, and then they're finding the different historical layers of still living people who are there. And then there's now you reviving a project from much earlier in your life and bringing it to light again in this new body. And so the, 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 the sense again of, arche of personal and um, global archaeology in the book is very rich and is captured, I think, by the uh, the very look of the book with the antique typeface and then like just th to narrate three pages of photos that are in a row. Statue of the river god Nile in Piazzetta Nilos, circa 1991, photo DR. It all, it's almost, there's a sense of for, things forensic about this, like DR is not our friend here, but a spy. <laughs> Neapolitan clock repair stand, circa 1991, photo DR. Engraved portrait of Ludovico Antonio Moratori from his Annale d'Italia, published in Naples, 1749, modified cartouche. What did it feel like to go back to project that you had, in a sense, turned away from or let lie fallow? Well, it's funny, you know, I, I came back to, I, I lived in Naples for, for three years, and uh, on coming back to New York, uh, I, I started to, I spent so much time reflecting on Naples and talking with friends about my, my time there, uh, one of whom was uh, John Ash, uh, who was living in New York City at the time, and he encouraged me to write about Naples. Uh, which hadn't really been my intention when going there, but I started to write, uh, write about my memories, and he would critique the, the essays, and that's how, how the project began. Uh, but then I started to uh, follow up on leads, like uh, uh, friends in Naples had, had told me about this uh, wonderful uh, Jacobin uprising of 1799 during the Napoleonic Wars when there was a short-lived uh, uh, Parthenopian Republic, so I, I started to research this at the New York uh, Public Library, the 42nd Street Library, and it just became, I started to, so it, it, the book involves, um, there's personal narrative, but also uh, descriptive historical episodes from the, the history of Naples. But, but what it felt like to, it was just such a, the project evolved over, over, over so many years, it, um, Part of part of bringing it to to uh, together in this in this book was about uh, uh, organizing the tesserae of the mosaic and, and finding a happy kind of co cohabitation between them. And there's something I I admire so much your visual works and your performances and, and videos and there's something so literally ceremonial ceremonial about Daniel's work and a sense of the um, bringing the sacred and the measurement, the measuring rituals that govern the sacred into the precincts of daily life, often not in the United States, but in other European cities, Aachen, for example, that there's that quality of measurement and a form of the sacred occupies this book as well. Mm -hmm. Like it's, in other words, that it's not just like a book, but it's a time ceremony about Daniel's time, Naples time, the time between your first book on Jewish uh, yeah. mystical undercurrents in abstract expression, American abstract expressionism, the connection of this to some of your vessels mm -hmm. and water ceremonies. I think you noticed also in the the forward that it, it, it's something of a, of a performance, the, the, the sojourn in, in Naples. Uh, it certainly did, I mean, it, there is a ceremonial aspect of, of life in Naples, certainly. I mean, it's, a, it's this ancient culture and people take great pride in whatever they do, like, like this welder who, was, uh, who elevated uh, you know, his craft to the, to the level of, of high of artistry. And, 
And the, the barista who, who makes the coffee, what, whatever you do, it's like a meditation or something. That, uh, and there's a lot of uh, ceremony in Nepal. People dress, people go out, you know, uh, they, they enjoy, uh, you know, seeing and, 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 and being seen and, and walking in the evening, you know, arm in arm. And uh, it's, a, it's a very theatrical culture. I mean, the Baroque was, uh, is the quintessential artistic expression of this city. And it's, it's, it's everywhere in the streets, but it's also in this kind of theater of the, the people. Uh, so much uh, that goes on only uh, behind closed doors in the United States is, is, is out on the street, you know, people, uh, uh, you know, talking, couples embracing, what have you. It's just a very, there's a whole kind of theater of, of daily life in Naples that's very, very beautiful and ceremonial, I would say. Is it time for the lugubrious recitation? I'm rather yes, yes. feeling suspenseful I, about I, it. I, I think this is a good moment. I could see some, one or two people nodding off, so this will be good. This will sort of rock you to sleep. Um, Joy always says to me when I'm reading, because this is a trick I've done many times before, she says, look up and pretend like you're talking to your audience. I'm going to lose my place, so I'm just going to read. Um, it was just about a year ago, this time in a April, but at the Drawing Center in New York City, that Wayne, Daniel, and I, and several of you in the audience, convened for a panel discussion of Daniel's book, Seeing Naples, Reports from the Shadow of Vesuvius. Now here we are again, this time at Hudson Hall in the old opera house, continuing what seems to be becoming a very charming ritual. Soon I will be off to Nice for another such convention. Perhaps I should give you a list, Daniel, of all the places I have not been and would like to go, and then you can arrange for all of us to gather still, still again in those places so that we can meditate with great pleasure on your work. It can become a kind of traveling round table and we can call ourselves the Knights of the Intelligentsia. Before continuing, I would like to thank everyone involved in inviting me, one of the co-publishers of, uh, me, one of the co-publishers of Daniel's book, along with Joy L. Glass, who was in the audience, and Howard B. Johnson, who is not, to be a part of these proceedings. I feel very honored to be here, and I must admit, slightly intimidated to discuss once again such an imposing and august book Hence my decision to write these remarks down for fear that I might get lost or muddled or worse. I ask only that you, the audience, forgive this formality. Even in these most postmodern of times, the shortest distance between two points still seems to be a straight line, and I prefer to get everything said, no matter how rigidly rather than haphazardly. I cannot think of two more different writers than Walter Benjamin and Walt Whitman. And yet, both come to mind when I read Daniel Rothbart's Seeing Naples, published by Edgewise Press just recently in 2018, a volume incorporating some 20 essays Rothbart wrote in the 1990s, sometime after studying at a, as a Fulbright scholar in the early part of that decade. A generally uninspired, sluggish, and self-righteous decade it was, coming on the heels of the flamboyant and decadent 1980s. How right Daniel was to jump on his motorino, metaphorically speaking, and head for Naples. In any case, Walter Benjamin, a German Jewish thinker born in 1892, was insular, eclectic, and what we today here in the States might describe as an intellectual elitist, interested in any number of fields, philology, theology, history, literary criticism, and philosophy. Although, as Hannah Arendt once pointed out correctly, he was none of these things, neither a philologist, theologian, historian, literary critic, nor a philosopher. He was somehow a composite of all these things, but not a jack of all trades and a master of none. He was rather a master in his own right. On the other hand, Walt Whitman was outgoing, all-encompassing, and a visionary who was interested basically in everything and everyone, but who was without question a poet, a first great American poet, who like Dante 700 years earlier, chose to write in the vernacular of his people, not in Latin, but in the vulgar tongue, Italian, in the case of Dante, and not in the English of Dr. Johnson, but in the language of the common sailor, in the case of Whitman. Although the irony here is that no tongue could be less vulgar in its own way and more, and more full of song than the Neapolitan dialect, unless it be Sicilian. <laughs> uh, Benjamin's ideal work was to speak 
to the voices of others, of the other, like a metaphysical ventriloquist. Whitman's ideal was work and the worker, per se. He was unwilling or unable to distinguish between the contribution of a welder and that of a pastor addressing his flock from the mount. The common man was his religion, not exactly endowed with a Benjaminian aura, but close. Much as the exceptional man comprised Nietzsche's libidinal itch, and the self-delusional man comprised Dostoevsky's. Everything and everyone interested Whitman, from the smallest blade of grass to the grand, grandest industrial cathedrals of America in its adolescent years. In Whitman's view, the Brooklyn Bridge with its twin medieval portals did not merely connect Brooklyn and Manhattan. It was a symbol of the bridges Americans wanted to build, whether they knew it or not, with each other and with the rest of the world, between men and women, men and men, women and women, and whatever forms of desire lay in between. And among these builders, by the way, there were a good many Italians, Neapolitans. In Whitman's world, this bridge was an orgasmic comet hurtling across the celestial skies that belonged ultimately to no one and to everyone. It would not be until we get to Hart Crane that this bridge would be rebuilt in the paradoxical name of a transcendent but, de but descending God. Not that the only difference between the two was that Crane became a suicide and Whitman lived to squeeze every drop of blood from the smallest rolling stone. Benjamin, of course, also killed himself on the night of September the 25th, 1940 in the border city of Port Boo, Cal Catalonia, believing erroneously that he was going to be deported to Nazi Germany the following morning. Life has a way of playing horrible tricks on us, but not without tempting us with a few treats along the way. Whitman could not give a hoot about Henry James's world of the innocent American dazzled and being taken advantage of by the experienced European abroad. If Whitman had taken an interest in that particular dialogical closet drama, it would have gathered into a more prophetic, hallucinogenic, Blakeian form of expression, exploding into an allegorical mise-en-scene, not unlike the one decorating the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel but in Whitman's version, it would have embodied even more forthrightly than Michelangelo, naked men and women discoursing in a Roman bathhouse, interrupted only by the sporadic cries of ecstasy emanating from its darkened corners. However, both Benjamin and Whitman, in their own emphatic and inimitable ways, believed they were socialists of the soul. They believed or trusted in the reality of the common man, and that he or she was or, in fact, had become in the modern world the prime movers of history. In this, surely, they were modern men, and thus anti-Hegelians to boot. Benjamin saw this phenomenon even in the passages or arcades of Paris, in the reflections and illuminations inspired by the shoppers, he most prominent among them, gazing into the store windows overflowing with goods that had not yet been subjected to his insightful and biting pre-semiotic analysis and strange form of historical materialism. In reality, his was a deformed species of Marxist analysis that would later appeal primarily in the 1960s to Guy Debord and the Situationists, who comprised, who comprised still another sidereal dialectical form of analysis. In any case, Benjamin saw this phenomenon of the proletariat, just short of lumpen, I suppose, raised to the exponential power of the new man in the drifter or flaneur, he being one of them, who was up to no good insofar as he knew perception i.e. the way we look at things, was beginning to trump reality. I hated to use that word. Horrible word. And of course, Benjamin saw this common ground, this commonality in the most porous or fugitive places and things, in book collecting, translation, the theater, the work of art in the age of mechanical reproduction, to use his own words, and most of all, in the impossibly intricate and tenebrous role memory plays in history. Nothing is more fragile and subject to distortion in the Proustian glassware of perception than history. We have only to gaze into our handheld devices, today's high-powered television sets, to see how true this is. And comparably, nothing inspired Whitman more than the common man or woman and the masses, not only in terms of what she and, and they could achieve in their paradoxical singularity, but even their plight in the course of pursuing their destiny transformed them and their commonality into a transcendent form of being, a form of being steeped in self-transformation. I do not believe there existed in Whitman's mind a man or a woman who would not choose to turn themselves inside out in an effort to better themselves or their collective souls. 
of what we call civilization, which he believed is our most precious, if ever evolving, legacy. America was nothing to him if it was not this self-transforming organism, for the most part made up of a rough sea of immigrants constantly splashing against the shores of a country that was never more than a breakneck idea or fungible experiment. And one of Benjamin's least read books, but among my favorite, and which I invariably recall when Joy and I are strolling in the vast grounds of the Tiergarten in Berlin, is his, Berl his book, Berlin Childhood Around 1900. In an index card of my own, tucked into the pages of this volume, I found the following citation. Memory is not an instrument for surveying the past, but it's theater. It is the medium of past experience, just as the earth is the medium in which dead cities lie buried. He who seeks to approach this, he who seeks to approach his own buried past, and I suppose that of others, must conduct himself like a man digging. Whitman would have loved this image of a man digging, but where Benjamin was interested in digging up dead cities, Whitman would have enjoyed seeing a shirtless laborer, the sweat tripping down his broad shoulders and back, digging deep in behalf of a new world and the spiritual skyscrapers of its future. Rothbard, finally, mm -hmm. is a perfect hybrid of the two, Benjamin and Whitman, digging for history but among the living and somehow turning that history through the brilliance of his writing style and the openness of his Whitman-esque vision into a living document, one wherein he has transformed his experiences and research so vividly into a brief history of Naples that we feel we can re-experience it ourselves, traveling with him through the streets, the highs and lows of this particular city's day-to-day -day reality, no matter how criminal or sanctified. Rothbard is the perfect hybrid of old-school intelligentsia and situationist, flaneur and out-of-pocket historian. In his talented and distinguished hands, this complex narrative he has woven becomes analogous to walking the, the smallest and darkest alleyways of the, of the city. Turning a page in his book becomes analogous to turning a street corner in Naples. And as we go from incident to incident, we feel like we are turning the pages of a real story that we ourselves are helping to compose as we go along. The analogical photographs and vintage postcards he has included in his, in his reports from the shadows, shadow of Vesuvius only encourage and further reconfirm this perception. Rothbard's Seeing Naples is not just a book of travel writings. In chapter after chapter, story after story, he presents us in Whitman-esque fashion with the derelict street life of Neapolitan history with, quote, perilous street crossings and encounters with modern day highwaymen, walking us through Neapolitan open air markets and the sprawling 18th century hospice for the poor, where we encounter, quote, fluttering laundry hanging from lines strung between parallel tenements, all of which become the proscenium of Benjamin's theater, his theater of memory and past experience. Among the players and actors in this theater, among those who execute the living history of Naples are Victoria De Sica, the director of the 1955 film, The Gold of Naples, who spent much of his childhood, uh, Daniel um, says, in the streets he portrayed, he portrayed in this and in many other films, and the printmaker Giorgio Carazza, the foundryman Gennaro Esposito, and the welder Egidio Balistrieri, all of whom, quote, opened their shop doors to share their perspectives on life, art, tradition, and their craft. And there are the, and there are the uh, expeditions uh, Daniel takes us on to the island of Capri and Matera, quote, a stone-hewn city in the mysterious Bellasicata region. It is as if we are traveling on the back of Daniel's motorino. And what indeed are we to make of Daniel's subtitle, Reports from the Shadow of Vesuvius? It becomes clear as we travel through the streets of Naples with him, the historical ones as well as the living ones, that the Neapolitans, like so many peoples with long histories living in modern times, have had to face the perils of transformation, personal and collective. They have had to do this if they were not only to survive but to flourish. Vesuvius is a mere symbol of the constant threats the Neapolitans have had to face persistently from within their government, but also from without, from the Camorra and from the church, from the past and from their future, namely from their understandable inability to change and from the worst kind of urban development. Like the traffic in Naples, which comes at you from all directions, these threats are relentless and omnipresent, 
And within a, within a conspicuous culture like Naples, they are all the more visible, even to an outsider like Na Daniel, who, however, lived in the city for three years. His reports are the authentic thing. Rothbard's Seeing Naples includes a discussion of the mythic origin of the city, named after the beautiful siren who once charmed Odysseus with her song, that's a quote, and walks with alchemists, fishmongers, and rebels. In Benjamin-esque, lightning-fast passages, Rothbard reconstructs the short-lived Jacobean revolution, that's a quote, that was in its essence an egalitarian and culturally rich expression of enlightenment ideas that heralded the values of the Italian Republic but that was ultimately crushed by Lord Nelson and Cardinal Fabi Russo. Did you know he was referred to as Fabi? Mm, anyway, no, it is impossible, the one little thing you didn't know, huh? <laughs> it is impossible for me to summarize here Rothbard's youthful and energetic travels through the streets of history and the history of the streets, which are so copious and so extensively drawn in the book. Cemeteries become settings for reflections on the cult of the dead, a communist mayor and a futurist painter, um, regale us with their philosophies and our theories, and quote, Giuliano Reiter, a Viennese Jew who escaped the Nazis in a circuitous flight across Europe, recounts his story from the safety of Pozzuolo. Let's face it, people like Daniel, and they like to tell their stories to him. They trust him. That is a handy thing to be, intelligent, likable, and a trustworthy person when you have a shovel in your hand and you are digging for dead cities that lie buried right beneath your feet in the same streets you were walking to buy a quart of milk. Not that butter would melt in his mouth. He also brings to light the vacillating fortunes of Neapolitan Jewry, Jewry from Roman times to the present. And to conclude this dizzying arcade of alternating tragic and ecstatic moments of history, he concludes with a, quote, visit to Regia di Caserta, the Neapolitan Versailles, a vast Baroque palace and water garden that is an island of order in the anarchic Neapolitan hinterland. I quoted a passage from Walter Benjamin at the beginning of this paper, and I feel it is only fair to quote something from Walt Whitman at the end. Quote, if a fellow was to write poetry, the secret is get in touch with humanity. Know what the people are thinking about. Retire to the very deepest sources of life back, back till there was no further point to retire to, unquote. Clearly, Daniel is writing poetry or a form of prose that lifts us up in the very same way poetry does or wants to, but often fails in the hands of lesser mortals. So much poetry written today possesses no real understanding of the necessary balance between narratives, range, or scope, and lyrical compression, the intoxicating highs and paradoxical lows of transformation. There is nothing that cannot be transformed, a la Neruda, into the most absolute of metaphorical forms. But what good is the transmutation if you leave the reader behind in the dust of your journey from vehicle to tenor? This is just a question, not an indictment. When we can import this balance, when, when we can import this balance to the writing of history or to a travelogue with historical dimensions, then we have stumbled upon something very special. And this is what we have before us in Daniel's case. If the secret of poetry is getting in touch with humanity, as Whitman says, then once again Rothbard has done just that in the pages of Seeing Naples. The book overflows with in-depth exchanges as well as nuanced contiguities. But I suspect Whitman had something else in mind when he spoke of getting in touch with humanity. I think he meant getting in touch with our humanity, with the part or parts of ourselves that make us, you and me, human, ideally both inside and out, or, or more human, more than we would otherwise be if we did not strive to become so. This can only mean reaching inside, where we cower or leap with fervent joy, where we can either become consumed by false pride or exhume even a modicum of self-respect that might flower into respect for others. I suspect by humanity he intended something along the lines of compassion, empathy, and a willingness to act not just in our own behalf, but in behalf of the best interest we all have in common. We need read only a few chapters of Seeing Naples to detect and be assured of the presence of this author's humanity throughout its pages. A humanity that is specific in every way and yet universal in character. In page after page, we get the feeling that we know what the people are thinking about, whether they are historical figures in the stories Rothbard recounts or the Neapolitans he has the good fortune to meet during his many escapades. 
The figures in history are as alive in his narratives as the living ones he encounters during his travels and adventures. To flow back and forth seamlessly across the horizon line of his sentences, excuse me, they flow back and forth seamlessly across the horizon line of his sentences. It is manifestly clear he has retired to the very deepest sources of his life, of life, back, back till there is no further point to retire to. Whether those sources are historical, aesthetical, or psychological, in terms of da Daniel's desire to enter into the minds and lives of the characters in his narrative. And by doing so, he enters our minds, lives, and hearts as we accompany him when we read this visionary, Benjamin-esque, Whitman-esque travelogue, seeing Naples reports from the shadow of Vesuvius that is uniquely and poignantly his. Sorry it was so long. You're beautiful. You're beautiful. I was going to say, if there's a, a question to ask you, Daniel, on the heels of that gorgeous tribute and elucidation of your Whitmanic and Benjaminian proclivities, um, it would, it, I think it would, the question has to do with semiotic street situations and maybe with the thought experiment of juxtaposing Naples and Hudson. There's a, a from my introduction to this book, there's a one line that overlaps or nicely with yours um, where I describe Daniel. I'll just read the first sentence and then ask my situationist question. Daniel Rothbard is a master of serene coruscating surfaces and of the depths they hide. Artificer, flaneur, ruminator, wanderer, scholar. He seems not to inhabit contemporary time, but to dwell in several temporalities simultaneously, like Spinoza astrally projecting himself into the lithe body of a situationist, then backtracking to star in Ben-Hur, and plummeting even farther netherward to glide on the never-drowning raft of the Medusa. So the situationist note, because a city that is farther from situationism than Naples, we cannot find. But like, so I guess this is like the, the game, the final game question is like, let's all think together, Hudson, situationism, Naples. Oh my. What do you think, Daniel? <laughs> I'm gonna need some help. On okay, that. no, I don't know. <laughs> Richard, you want to start out? Well, you know, I uh, first of all, the passage you just read from your your preface. Uh, do you, you guys? When's the last time you guys read Nabokov? Or you know, that's pretty luxurious writing. Um, you, you know, I'm I've been so exhausted recently. I'm not sure I understand your question. Okay, Wayne. Maybe I'm, maybe I'll just say, no no put it. Okay okay the thing is there's this. Gorgeous. There's this city, Naples, that maybe I've only been to once, and I had some terrible experiences there in a pensione and on a street where I, sh I should not have tried to go with my little rented car. <coughs> you know, it, um, I didn't have food poisoning, but I mean, just really once, once, but so fondly remembered. To me, it's a, it's, it's a, a fiction in a sense. And then here we are in Hudson in this restored palace called somewhat strangely an opera house, but we'll take it. Um, and it, it's, it's, stun it's also a kind of archeological thing. And then we're in this city, Hudson, in this country, the United States, and Hudson is itself a, a, a fascinatingly layered place in which uh, like in a, is it a Sicilian casata or something? We're like perched on top of it with our Neapolitan reflections. And then, um, uh, Daniel, when I first met you, you gave me a business card and it said semiotic street situations, which is the name of your practice. So I guess to take this all down to earth, what is semiotic street situations? Um, well, it's, it's my, my enterprise it encompasses every aspect of my uh, creative project uh, across different different media, from writing to to printmaking, to sculptural objects, to uh, collaborative performance work, uh, to media work, and 
But it's, it's true, I guess, in, in terms of the, the, the parallel between Hudson and, and, and Naples, it's intriguing. I mean, we're, this is certainly such a historic venue and uh, it's a beautiful opera house. Uh, and I, I think it's so appropriate, actually, I was reflecting that the, what an appropriate uh, place to present seeing Naples in, uh, on the stage of, a, of an opera house uh, uh, with uh, such a, a, a libertist and a, a, you wrote a, a wonderful uh, book, The Queen's Throat on, on, on opera. And, uh, and of course, I, when I first met Wayne, Wayne uh, told me that he had been to San Carlo and at uh, the Teatro San Carlo and, and uh, heard an opera there, which I, I later had the wonderful experience to, to do as well. But uh, there's something you know, profoundly operatic about Naples and the, uh, the, the incredibly uh, theatrical nature of uh, Neapolitans and how they express so, so many uh, uh, you know, aspects of, of their lives. So, uh, and of course, Bellini and you know, uh, so, so many, so, so I think it's the perfect Perfect. I, I, and perfect I love place. that, and I, I think I guess semiotic street situations also means to me that on the streets of Williamsburg, uh, on the streets of Hudson, on the streets of Naples, we're going to read the signs that we're going to mm -hmm. look into the semiotics or the sign science of what's really around us and ask questions of the objects and buildings that are really around us, regardless of their cultural capital in a sense, and that Naples has cultural capital and it doesn't, in, in the same way that you could say of Hudson, and that this, I think that the, um, but the project that I think is very much yours of reading the signs to discover the situations that are there, but also in the spirit of situationism, to make a little bit of an explosion. And so I would, I guess, want to point out the, the Vesuvian aspects of your book and the feds <laughs> reports from the shadows shadow of Vesuvius that however, in a way, um, tenderly observing your tone is, there's some, mis there's some necessary political historic mischief, as Benjamin knew, buried in just like what we do when we pay attention to the antiques on Warren Street. No, that's a nice parallel. Is it, do we have questions from the audience? Is yeah, that a thing that happens yeah. in Hudson? What, why do we do that? Why don't, we, why don't you guys do a little work yourself now? They've, ask you've us done some your work. You've done a good job. Uh, ask some questions. Uh, the question is, is how far does, uh, does Naples physically extend its territory within Italy? And it's, it's part of the Campania region of Italy, so it uh, occupies a, a fairly um, large uh, swath of, of, of southern Italy. Uh, let's see, uh, Caserta, uh, Naples, uh, the islands, uh, Gaeta, it's a, it was, it was originally the kingdom of the, the two Sicilies. Uh, uh, it was, uh, it, it, in the 19th century, it actually comprised, uh, and, and before, through the, I think from the 1600s to the Risorgimento in Italy, it was, it was ruled by the, uh, the viceroy, uh, the Spanish viceroy, um, and it also included, uh, so it was uh, si Sicily and, and uh, Naples. Uh, yeah, and the region surrounding, uh, surrounding it. But maybe to answer in a, in a different way, to add to that, Naples is he, Naples goes wherever Daniel goes, or that we, you know, wherever the, without actually taking the dirt uh, with us, it, 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 it travels with us. You know, Daniel gave me some pigment, beautiful, two little bottles of raw pigment from Venice. So I think there may be literally in your pocket some little bit of Naples. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, yes, I, I, that actually, that was an image that was uh, conceived by my wife, Francine Hunter McGivern, and we had, uh, 
Richard and I had been working, working on the book and we were thinking about the, uh, what, what kind of uh, image could best exemplify this, this work. And she said, it sh there should be a motorcycle uh, in front of Mount Vesuvius. So I, I sourced the imagery and, and played with the collage, but that, that was Francine's uh, inspiration. Levitating as well, right? Levitating in a way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> levitating from the heat of your reading. <laughs> from your, but literally levitating from the, the high on the fumes of your semiotic <laughs> discoveries, I think. Yes? That's a good question. You know, it's funny. I, I had visited Naples in a very kind of, uh, as a student, and what initially drew me to Naples were, were very, uh, the things that draw most people to Naples. I mean, it's, 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 it's a very, it's extraordinary uh, Baroque architecture, museums, uh, natural beauty. But, uh, and I, I applied for a, for a Fulbright grant. Uh, I was fortunate enough to be awarded uh, the grant. But then when I arrived, I quickly understood that this was a question of complete and utter immersion in a, in a city that demanded uh, an intense kind of... Uh, uh, it, 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 there was no, f I mean, you really, you had to be, uh, respond to the, uh, the rhythms of life there, uh, the cultural uh, milieu, the cultural, uh, uh, you know, I, I had to quickly learn, you know, improve my Italian, I also had to learn some dialect. Uh, and then I had the interesting good fortune to meet people from so many different walks of Neapolitan life, from real hardcore proletarians to the, uh, First communist mayor of Naples. Uh, so, in a funny way, it was it was it was great to revisit those uh, those encounters and conversations, and then commit them to paper in the form of the book. No, I, I was awarded a Fulbright uh, as a visual artist, so my intention was not to write about Naples. I was going to develop a body of studio work, which I did. Um, the book came to, um, the book evolved after I returned to New York City, uh, and uh, I, I met uh, John Ash, the, the English poet, who encouraged me to write about my experiences in Naples, and he had written a poem about Naples also uh, in the burnt pages. And, I started to write about these experience, he, experiences, and then he would uh, he would read the, the essays and critique them, and that's how the book was born, initially. But then it evolved into something more complicated. So you painted, uh, this visual project, is it photographs? Well, that's the other thing. I'm. I'm, I'm very yeah. This well, I, I'm also. My wife is a, a, an obsessive documentarian, and I started to, um, some of that rubbed off on me, and I, I began to collect, I had already taken photographs, snapshots of, of Naples, uh, some of which are in the book, and then I started to collect ephemera about Naples, and at this point I have a digital library of some uh, 1,200 images of Naples, and then from those images, uh, Richard and I selected uh, appropriate, uh, he selected, well, for, for the book, so. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, there's one in the back and then over here. Yeah. Uh, well, having dinner in Naples, uh, well, tra you know, uh, traffic might be. Uh, you know, passing uh, uncomfortably by uh, in Naples. A posteggiatore uh, might come and, and sing to you uh, uh, in Naples. Uh, you'd have a, have a beautiful view, perhaps, of the, uh, of the ocean and the islands. Uh, you know, it's, the, you know, it would be, uh, the food might be uh, more delectable. <laughs> uh, and the company would be, would certainly, would certainly be, be different, but, 
Um, Yes, I, you know, I, I went back to Naples last year because we were, we were invited to, to present the book at the Museum and Royal Park of Capo di Monte, which was uh, really overwhelming. And I hadn't been back to Naples for about 12 years. But when, when, I, when I returned to the city, I was shocked because it was, it, first of all, the, the traffic is one of the most distinct, you know, is so distinctive, or used to be uh, so so chaotic, and you had this this movement in every direction that immediately kind of assaults your your senses and gives you a sense of the vibrancy and vitality of this place. Uh, but nowadays, I mean, the the city is largely uh, there are uh, zone pedonali you can only go if, go by foot. Um, the Spanish Quarter, which is a rough neighborhood uh, off the Via Roma, which is kind of a fashionable shopping neighborhood, it's basically um, guarded. The, 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 these vicoli that lead up to the Spanish Quarter are guarded by uh, Italian soldiers with weapons of war uh, to prevent uh, purse snatchings from the, you know, from the vicoli. And there must have been a murder while I was there because I was walking down the street and I heard in dialect uh, this man from the, court, from the uh, Spanish Quarter say they've closed off the whole neighborhood. And sure enough, I, I walk a couple more blocks. There must be 400 uh, soldiers from the Italian army uh, who, who, are, who have literally closed off the neighborhood of the, the Spanish Quarter. And, you know, so, so it's, it's kind of a controlled... Um, uh, uh, comfortability for, for tourists. Uh, but it, and, and another thing that was kind of an odd experience, I was walking in the historical uh, center to, to visit a church with a Caravaggio. And I heard this beautiful uh, kind of melancholy uh, song that, that I used to hear that, you know, th these kind of Arabic strains, beautiful uh, kind of mysterious uh, uh, notes that, uh, and I used to hear that all the time when I was living there in the early 90s. So I, I followed the, the music, and it, it was a man who was singing, but not for his own pleasure. And he would, uh, he, there were tourists now in, the, in, in Naples, so, so he, would, he would lower a basket from his window, and the tourists would put money in the basket, you know. So, yeah, very different Naples today, but, it, but still the same, too, you know. Still the basket. Still the basket, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What about the traffic lights? Do they have any function? None whatsoever. No, right. okay, that hasn't changed. Just, just a couple of comments. Um, you know, when Daniel's talking about, you know, going to see this Caravaggio, you know, in Palermo, which is a city which used to really be out of control, kind of like the way Naples is, even to this day, there was a Caravaggio, but then it was stolen. <laughs> so it was gone. But the Palamitani are really strange people because they... They, where the Caravaggio was is, of course, a giant shadow. And they, uh, when you go into the church, if, you, if you're uh, engaged, uh, uh, the priest there, and he'll talk about the Caravaggio. He'll point to the Caravaggio and the wall, the shadow, where it once was. Um, and then um, uh, the other thing I wanted to say about Palermo, you know, uh, Palermo used to be a really kind of perilous city like Naples, and then it became kind of, today it's become a kind of um, rather, rather tame in a weird way. You have to go to Catania to, to look for trouble. Uh, but you still find trouble in, uh, in, in Naples, right? You could, your vehicle could be stolen if you don't pay the pizza. You, am I right? I mean, is, is it still, it still has a vitality to it. It's not like Palermo. Palermo, you can get your camera stolen, but it's not, not what it once was in terms of it's not the 42nd the Street. Good old of days of purse yeah. snatching. <laughs> <laughs> well, the good old days of 42nd Street, you know, they're gone. I, it's, an, it's a good analogy, I think. You know, yes. but, I think the, the, the roughness of, of Naples was very, part, of its, uh, part of its charm, certainly, mm. and, yeah. and fascination. Um, but, and, and in fact, when we presented, we presented it at the Museum of Capo di Monte, Riccardo Note, 
who is one of the, the people, friends who I describe in the book. Um, he, he, he's a professor at the uh, Academia di Brera in Milan, uh, and a, a cultural anthropologist. And he's, he, he made remarks about the book, but one of the things that he was concerned about was that uh, he, he, he was you know, he, he was worried that too many concessions were being made for, for tourism and that, in fact, the city had to, had to maintain its, uh, its distinctive character. And one of the things that really uh, impressed me when I arrived in Naples was that uh, Italy, Italy had largely been uh, assimilated into a, uh, I mean, the land, for example, before the Risorgimento, uh, Naples was all these different uh, principalities uh, and, and each had its own kind of dialect, and, and the radio helped to uh, bring about what Pasolini referred to as a, a pianificazione culturale, a, a cultural flattening, uh, linguistic flattening. But not in Naples. Naples absolutely, adamantly um, uh, persevered in maintaining its, uh, its cultural uh, distinctiveness and identity, and, and I, I have enormous respect for the Neapolitans to, uh, in, in accomplishing that. And I'm a little concerned about the, the, the well-being that tourism brings. I mean, there's certainly more money and affluence. And one of the things, that, I mean, is positive, too, in a certain respect, because Francine, my wife and I were walking a, along the, um, uh, near the Spanish Quarter, and we saw this, uh, uh, the sign, uh, uh, Benvenuti ai quartieri spagnoli, welcome to the Spanish quarters. This is a tough neighborhood. You wouldn't <laughs> want to walk into the Spanish quarter before. But all of a sudden, there's kind of a sense of national, or, you know, uh, uh, of pride in, in, in welcoming people to this place. And this is, this is our, you know, this is our home and welcome. Well, Baltimore is charm city. Yeah. <laughs> so it's that kind of thing, I guess. You, before I take your question, you know, the thing about, one thing about Palermo is I, I became so desperate to find perilous, the perilous Palermo of old that I would go into the Arab quarter, quarter which to this day is uh, a precarious place to walk through. And the marvelous thing about the Arab quarter of Palermo is that all the signs are in Arabic. Amazing. I mean, I'm walking around in a place where I don't know. Well, my favorite places in the world, of course, are places where English is not spoken. Oh. And uh, there you are in Palermo in a little section where. Um, uh, and one other thing, I'm sorry about bringing up Palermo, but it is related to Na Naples very, very much so, unless we talk about Catania. Uh, you, it's something which people don't know is that to this day, when you go to Palermo, even for all of its civility, there are still ruins from the Second World War. And to my knowledge, it's the only city in Europe that I've ever seen in which the, the buildings that were bombed are, are swept into a neat piles, and then a fence is built around them, and then they just stay there. And they've been like that since the war. Unbelievable. I mean, if you want to see traces of the Second World War, go to Palermo. Daniel, I don't know, if to, to perhaps to wrap up, or to, 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 what was the phrase that you used from Pasolini? Oh, pianificazione culturale, a cultural flattening. Yeah, I just, it feels like one, a, a really great moral from this book is, is it's a manifesto against cultural flattening. Yeah. And that we could add Pasolini to Benjamin and Whitman yeah. as kind of poets of poets, revolutionaries yes. Yes. of cities. Yes, absolutely, that's wonderful. Yeah, that's true. Beautiful. Okay. So you should, there's copies of the book for sale back there, and it, it, it is sewn in a way that it will, it is sewn in a way that it will never decay. Yes. Yes. <laughs> what, Both the prose what, and the pages. Uh, what, what, just a, another five minutes. Ralph, yeah. you yes. have something? I'm sorry, I didn't, it was difficult for me to hear you. Uh, I didn't quite understand the question.
So the destructiveness of the motorcycle and the volcano. Uh, well, it's true. There, there, it's a very, uh, there was definitely a sense of living on the edge in, in Naples at that time, in the early 90s. It was a dangerous city, um, and it was dangerous to, to, to uh, ride around on the motorino and everything. Um, but it was also completely fascinating. And I think, I think maybe that's, that's part of what's uh, frustrating about Naples today is that uh, it's not, uh, I mean, there's more affluence, but, but there's less, uh, that, that, that kind of uh, grit uh, is, is, is starting to, uh, to fade. And, and yeah. yeah, I just wanna make one point about what Wayne said. You know, uh, whenever you bring up the name Pasolini in Italy, um, most, many refined, refined people and culturally very refined and know, knowing people will immediately critique you and say, you know, Pasolini this and Pasolini that. He was a great reporter, but he was not a great poet. He's not a great writer. I, I think quite the contrary. I, I loved Pasolini because he was derelict and, and didn't care very much about, or oftentimes didn't care so much about form. And I, I think it's marvelous that you somehow brought in Pasolini into the discussion in relationship to Whitman, who was also very loosely put together. And, um, and Benjamin, who is, is, is also another eclectic figure. It's also, I mean, the, the, the De Sica images, and here the sense of neo Italian neorealism and the whole, yeah. just, you know, yeah. De Sica and Pasolini are belong, they're on the board of directors of semiotic street situations. <laughs> okay, you guys are all dismissed. <laughs>